uh, Aaron Troma. And uh, Zeyu is going to give the talk. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Hello. Yeah, hi everyone, glad to be here. Uh, so today, uh, my name is Ze Yu Liu. Uh, today I'm gonna to talk about Oblivious Message Retrieval. It's a joint work with Iran Trommer. So let's start with uh, motivation. So we have four uh, anonymous message delivery systems. We have some senders who want to send, send some payloads uh, to some recipients. Uh, they will these payloads can be text messages or coin transfers, and they first uh, send the message to some central database in cryptocurrency. This central database is realized by some bulletin board, and in apps like Signal or WhatsApp, it's a central server. Then the recipient wants to retrieve the messages that are addressed to them, uh, which we call the pertinent messages. There have been lots of work studying about the sending privacy and bulletin board privacy, but how about recipient privacy? How can a recipient retrieve the message, pertinent messages without leaking their identity or metadata? One trivial solution is that we can uh, simply let the recipient download the whole database and distill themselves locally. But this can be too expensive in both bandwidth and computation. Uh, another solution is that we can introduce a third party, which we call a detector. This detector will hold the board and help the recipient to distill and uh, uh, compressed into some digest that contains the pertinent messages sent back to the recipient. Uh, in applications like uh, Distil, uh, in, in applications like Zcash, they use Distil full scan. Basically, the uh, detector tries to chop the big messages into smaller messages and then uh, send the smaller messages messages back to the, to the recipient. The digest size is smaller uh, than the than the bulletin board, uh, but still uh, is quite large, and the digest size is linear to n. Uh, one prior work is called uh, fuzzy message detection. It's decoy based, so it has relatively weak uh, privacy guarantee. And uh, also the computation and, uh, and communication costs are dependent on the privacy it provides. It also uh, requires honest senders and recipients, which we'll get into a little bit more detail later. Another related work is called private signaling. Uh, it has two constructions. The first construction uh, re requires trusted hardware like Intel SGX. And the second construction assumes two communicating but not including uh, servers. So as you can see that both of the construct constructions have relatively uh, strong environmental assumptions. And they also require honest standards and recipients. Our results, uh, we have defined and uh, uh, constructed oblivious message retrieval and oblivious message detection that is fully private on the strong security notions based on FHE plus some application-driven optimizations and uh, based on our benchmark is practical for Bitcoin scale applications. Uh, our schemes have a clue-based clue -based model. Uh, what do I mean by that? So, so, uh, for, so the recipients hold some secret keys and they use the secret keys to generate two uh, public keys. The first one is the clue key and the second one is the detection key. The sender will use the clue key to generate some clue and then together with the payload, they will put the clue and payload to the bulletin board and then uh, the recipient will send the detection key to the detector. The detector will use uh, the bulletin board, the clues and payloads together with the uh, detection key to accumulate and get some digest, send the digest back to the recipient. And then the rec recipient will process and get the plain text payload back. For the functionalities, we call them uh, oblivious message de detection and oblivious message retrieval. Uh, the detection means that only the pertinent indices will be sent back. Uh, but for the retrieval, the payloads will be sent back. We mainly have two goals. The first one is that we want the detector learn to learn nothing about the recipient. It shouldn't learn which messages are pertinent and it shouldn't learn, uh, it, furthermore, it shouldn't learn who is doing the retrieval with what keys. Our second goal is that we want the digest size to be much smaller than the bulletin size. Ideally, it should only be proportional to the number of uh, pertinent messages. So uh, to begin our uh, construction, uh, let's start with the simplest one. Uh, we begin with uh, detection using generic FHE. So now the recipient holds a, a FHE secret key and an FHE public key. The sender will use the FHE public key to encrypt L once. Uh, and this L is some public parameter to be fixed later. And then they will put this FHE ciphertext on the bulletin as clues. 
uh, and then the detector will use the exact same FHE, uh, the, the, the FHE public key from the recipient uh, to do the recrypt. Uh, when I say recrypt, I basically mean that this function, this function tries to homomorphically decrypt this FHE ciphertext. So it's like bootstrapping in, uh, in more than FHE schemes. And then uh, for the pertinent ones, uh, which are marked in pink, uh, is, since they are using the same FHE public key, uh, they will be recrypted into one as well. And if we use an end gate, we will get one. And for the important messages, uh, if we do recrypt, since they are using two different uh, public keys and they are all independently generated, uh, we will get uh, zeros with probability one over half, uh, one over two. And if we use an end gate, we will get zero with probability roughly one uh, minus two to the negative L. This is where uh, L comes, comes, into, comes into play to reduce the false positive rate. And then uh, we call this zero and ones a uh, pertinency vector. They are just uh, FHE ciphertext. And if we send back to the recipient, uh, they will, the recipient will use the uh, secret key to decrypt and get the plain text payloads. Uh, as you can see that um, if we do this, the digest size, which is the pertinency vector PV is still linear in N. So our next step is how can we com compress this communication into sublinear? So to compress it, we used a very similar technique as the technique introduced in uh, private stream search by Ostrovsky and Skate uh, in 05. First, we initialize M uh, accumulators and counters. Uh, this M is, uh, should be greater than uh, the number of pertinent mes messages. And then what we do is we simply multiply the indices with the PV we just computed from our last step. And for the impertinent messages, we will get zeros. Uh, and for the pertinent messages, we will get FHE ciphertext encrypting the indices. Then we randomly assign these results into one of the accumulators and counters. For the impertinent ones, uh, the counters and accumulators will remain unchanged. And for the pertinent ones, uh, the accumulators will be added by the indices and the counters will be incremented by one. So if we finish all the assignments, we can simply uh, send back all the accumulators and counters back to the recipient. Then the recipient will be able to decrypt and uh, decode the uh, pertinent indices. Uh, but as you can see, there's one issue. Uh, there can be collisions. So multiple pertinent, pertinent messages can, uh, indices can be assigned to the same accumulator. Uh, that's when uh, counter comes into play. Uh, counter in that case will be greater than one, so it can be easily detected. And then after detection, uh, we can uh, handle this issue by using repetition and deduction. Uh, we omitted the details here. We refer the audience to the paper for more details. And uh, our next step is to uh, change from detection to retrieval. Actually, there's one very trivial solution to do the retrieval is that if we can simply replace uh, this column of indices with payloads, and then we will, uh, using the exact same technique, we will be able to accomplish the retrieval. Uh, the issue with that is that the hiding constant uh, of these techniques is relatively high, and also the, we, we generally assume that the payloads are much larger than the indices. So uh, the communication cost in this case will be uh, much larger. To uh, be more efficient, uh, we propose a different coding technique to uh, do the retrieval. So first, as before, uh, we compute the payload uh, multiply, multiply it with the PV, and we will get uh, PV for the pertinent uh, messages and get zeros for the non-pertinent messages as before. And then uh, instead of assigning them randomly to some buckets, we will generate some pseudo-random weight matrix. This weight, weight matrix has size uh, began times M, and then uh, we will get M uh, linear combinations. So this S as long as at least k of them, where k is the number of pertinent messages, are linearly independent, uh, we will be able to use Gaussian elimination to resolve and solve all the uh, payloads back. One issue with this uh, technique is that um, the, the detector computation cost is quite large because the, it's, for each message, the cost is, uh, is on, om, little m. So uh, to reduce this cost, we are trying to use uh, sparse random linear coding. In this case, the weights, uh, the weight matrix will be uh, slightly lightweight, so only a limited number of them will be non-zero. Uh, and then after using that, the cost per message will be reduced to quasi-constant. So thus far, we have, uh, uh, we have constructed a generic FHE-based uh, OMD and OMR. Asymptotically, they are efficient and succinct. Uh, they have sublinear communication cost and quasi-linear computation cost. However, it's still quite impractical because FHE has a high computational and communication cost. 
it can take milliseconds to do the end gate, and it can take uh, kilobytes for a single FEC server test. Uh, to, to make it more practical, uh, we introduce lots of optimizations. One key optimization is that instead of using FEC ciphertext as clues, we will use PVW ciphertext as clues. PVW ciphertext basically uh, is quite similar to LW ciphertext. It has an A part and it has a, P, a B part. This B part has L field elements if we want to encrypt L bits. The decryption is basically the same as LW. We first do an inner product, and then we do an addition and do a range check. We will get zero or one. Uh, since we have since we have removed uh, the the use of FHE uh, as clues as clues, we don't we don't actually need the recrypt part. Uh, and recrypt or bootstrapping is normally the most expensive in today's FHE scheme. Uh, so we we can just simply remove it and use a leveled FHE uh, leveled FHE scheme. For level HE, HE scheme, uh, we choose a BFD homomorphic encryption scheme uh, that supports simd like field operations. Basically, it means that for a BFD ciphertext, inc it encrypts multiple uh, field elements uh, in one ciphertext and can be operated at the same time. Then uh, we can perform the uh, simd like BFV decryption uh, using, using uh, BFV. So uh, the inner product and addition are relatively friendly to HE schemes. Uh, but the range check is slightly uh, more complicated. We, we directly use the results from LCD 21. Uh, afterwards, we'll get a BFB ciphertext encrypting zero ones, which is exactly the PV we wanted before. And then we can uh, proceed with the uh, proceed with the uh, coding techniques we have discussed before. So putting everything together, we have a uh, hybrid use of PVW uh, encryption and BFB uh, encryption. And basically, the uh, the recipient will have hold uh, BFE public keys as clue keys, and then the sender will use P, uh, BF, uh, PVW uh, to encrypt a clue, and then uh, the BFE uh, public keys will be used as detection keys. The detector will operate uh, all the operations using the BFE homomorphic encryption, and then uh, use the use the techniques we have discussed before, uh, accumulate and get a BFA ciphertext as digest, send back to the recipient. The recipient will simply decrypt and do a Gaussian elimination uh, to get the plant text payloads. Uh, this is actually, so far it's quite practical, but still not super practical. Therefore, we have introduced uh, some other uh, additional uh, optimizations. The first one uh, is for FHC tailoring. We have uh, optimized uh, letter of moduli, homomorphic operation scheduling, uh, symmetric BFB encryption, leveled specific uh, homomorphic rotation keys. And we also have some uh, scheme specific uh, optimizations. For example, we have a uh, tailored range check. So uh, this is just to, uh, simply to reduce the false positive rate and to reduce the uh, public parameter L, if you remember. Uh, it will reduce the, both the clue size and the computation cost. Another uh, optimization is a technique we used was uh, deterministic bitwise index retrieval. This is used, this is another way to do the, in, uh, to do OMD and um, uh, we won't be able to go uh, through details uh, here. And um, lastly, we also, lastly, we also have some application til uh, driven tailoring uh, like memory footprint reduction and streaming updates with low latency finalization. Uh, okay, uh, so, we have also ob observed that the part, there are some attacks that are possible to attack uh, the prior schemes. So uh, therefore we have introduced some strong security notions defined and trying to make our construction uh, surface and against those attacks. The first one is the denial of service attack. Uh, so imagine this scenario, a sender wants to overload a recipient. It can simply obtain the clue key from the, the recipient, uh, generate th thousands of clues, uh, and then uh, thousands of messages and put on the bulletin board. And then the detector will detect uh, that message, those, all those thousands of messages as pertinent and set, send back to the recipient. Then the recipient will be overloaded because it has thousands of messages. This is kind of inherent and uh, probably unavoidable for this kind of applications, but it can get worse. If we have an, a malicious sender uh, who uh, try to uh, generate a clue that can be detected as pertinent to every recipient. In this case, if they uh, simply generate a thousands of clues, then all of the recipients will get overloaded. And uh, we have observed that F prior two schemes, FMD and PS are both vulnerable to uh, this kind of attacks. And we are trying to uh, mitigate this attack. Uh, we do this by introducing a conjecture. 
So uh, we call this conjecture the snake high conjecture for LWE encryption. Suppose we have two pairs of uh, regex 05 keys, and then the uh, the adversary will try to generate a ciphertext that the ciphertext using the both secret keys will be decrypted into zero. Uh, that's why also why we call this uh, snake high conjecture because two zeros. And um, uh, of course, we require that the A part of the ciphertext to be non-zero. So it's a non-trivial uh, ciphertext. Uh, then we, uh, our question is that, is this possible? Well, it is trivially possible with probability one half, of course, uh, but how about with non-negligible probability? So i.e. with probability uh, half plus non-negligible. Our conjecture is that this is invisible. But this is not directly implied by standard notions like semantic security or key privacy. For PKE schemes like Algamal, it's really impossible uh, for uh, non-trivial probabilities. And we have tried to prove this uh, under SIS, plus some uh, generaliz generalization of knowledge of knapsack noisy in the product introduced in BCC T12. Uh, one one uh, minor thing is that we have also pr uh, proved that if this holds for the uh, regf uh, encryption, it also holds for the uh, PBW encryption. Another attack is uh, key, key linkability. So given the keys, uh, can we try to find the identity of the recipients? And we, uh, to, uh, to, against, to be against this uh, kind of attack, we define three notions of key unlinkability. The first one is detection key to detection key, key unlinkability. Uh, if a recipient holds two different detection keys, uh, it should be indistinguishable from two different uh, recipients holding two different dis detection keys. The second one is clue key to clue key unlinkability. If we have uh, a recipient holding two clue keys, it should be indistinguishable from uh, two, uh, two recipients holding two clue keys. The last one is clue key to detection key unlinkability. If the detector is holding some uh, detection key, it should not be able to uh, link it back to any of the clue keys. Uh, both of the prior works are vulnerable to this attack, and we have defined and achieved this attack, uh, proved this under uh, standard ring LW assumption. Uh, lastly, due to time constraint, I will very fast go through the uh, uh, benchmarks. Uh, so for the this is only for detection schemes. Uh, so as you can see, for detection schemes, we have the fastest runtime for the uh, detector uh, computation, even compared to the SGX-based solution as an MPC-based solution. Uh, this is the retrieval benchmark. This is for retrieval-based schemes. And um, as you can see that we, uh, although our runtime is, uh, is slower, that we, we do provide full, uh, full privacy. And also uh, we, we do believe that this uh, runtime is still quite practical. Uh, for recipient costs, uh, there are two parts for the recipient costs. The first is the digest size, i.e. the communication cost. And the second one is the digest runtime, uh, the uh, receiver runtime. And then uh, from the figures, we can see that as, as the, um, if we have large amount of messages, our schemes have a better performance uh, while maintaining the strongest privacy guarantees and uh, under minimal uh, environmental assumptions. Uh, some real-world prospects. Uh, based on our uh, GCP uh, instance benchmarks, uh, we have seen that um, the cost is roughly $1 per million message scanned. And this means roughly $0.02 cents per month for Dcash and roughly $1 to $2 uh, per month for Monero. Uh, we have also uh, some we also have some integration considerations. In the benchmark, we are using the uh, payload size from Zcash, which is roughly 600 bytes. Uh, kilo, uh, 600 bytes. And then uh, we also need to consider the clue key distribution as the clue key needs to be obtained by the, uh, by the sender pri uh, privately. So we probably need to uh, embed them into the recipient's public address or short URL from which the clue key can be fetched. Uh, for clue embedding, uh, our clue is actually quite large right now. It's roughly one kilobyte uh, and it's quite close to the uh, Zcash shielded transaction. Uh, and we also need to extend the transaction format to uh, have a dedicated clue field. And some other ways like operators, uh, operator field in Zcash transactions may also be used. Uh, lastly, about uh, detection latency. So if, a, so if a recipient sends a request saying that I want to retrieve messages, they may need to wait a long time uh, for it to get back. Uh, to resolve that problem, we uh, introduced the technique called the streaming updates so that the, co the cost will be greatly reduced so that the wait time is then acceptable. 
future works. Uh, there's one ongoing project. Uh, in the ongoing project, we have been able to reduce the uh, detector cost by roughly uh, two point times faster. And then uh, the, the main goal of that ongoing project is actually to re re uh, resolve the group messaging. Uh, so if we have one message and we have multiple recipients, uh, one trivial way is that we just let the sender uh, generate multiple messages at the same time, uh, but this can be quite costful in both storage and detector time, detector room time. So we want to do that more efficiently. Uh, another ongoing project is that we are trying to work with the Zcash Lightwallet team to, uh, to uh, integrate our OMR with the Lightwallet D. There are also some future directions like reducing size of clues, clue keys, detection keys, DOS resistance from senders, assumptions, and integrity against uh, fully malicious detectors. These are all very interesting uh, future possible directions. And that's my talk for today. Thank you all very much for listening. Okay, we have time for maybe one or even two questions um, while the next speaker is setting up. And if there is no question directly. Uh, there may be question from my side. So one of your motivations is to use this for uh, identifying messages in secure messaging. The difference between uh, these, I would say, for, uh, between these coin-based uh, uh, motivations and messaging is that usually in these transaction settings, you want to keep these transactions online and you want to don't want to delete them. But in messaging, you're happy uh, that your delivery server at some point can remove those messages that have been delivered. And so the question would be, do you have some idea how to detect those messages that you can already delete? Because one of your key properties of the scheme is that uh, the detector nor the server knows which messages actually have been delivered and which of those were just shipped uh, to the receiver. Yeah, it's... So if we have a detector that holds the entire bit base, then it can easily uh, trace back and get the previous messages that are even like deleted from the central database. Uh, but um, so if if the detector doesn't hold that, and then uh, I don't I don't see an obvious, obvious way to do that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Ah, there is another question. Yeah, sure. Hey, Hi. Uh, nice talk. Uh, just a question. So you mentioned you use the sparse linear coding to improve the efficiency. Yes. Do you get provable guarantees with it for correctness, or is it a heuristic approach? Uh, no, we have uh, strict proofs for okay. that. Thank you. Okay. Let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. And while Alex is setting up, I can already introduce him and his talk so this uh, the next talk is uh, about a paper that was soft merged with another paper uh, the paper that Alex will present today uh, has the title a more complete analysis of the signal double ratchet algorithm it is joint work by Alex Beanstalk Jaden uh, Fire Rose, Sanjam Gak, uh, Pred J. Mukherjee, and uh, Srini Vasan uh, Raguraman. And the other paper that was soft merged with it uh, has the title Universally Composable End to End Secure Messaging. And it was written by Ran Kanetti, Palak Jain, Mar uh, Marika Svanberg, and Mayank Varia. Yes, and Alex is giving the talk. Uh, the stage is yours. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. So yeah, very happy to be here in my first crypto. Um, so yeah, let's get started. So yeah, what's the signal protocol? Well, of course, it's a secure messaging protocol for long-lived sessions. Uh, that was originally based on the off-the-record protocol. Um, and of course, it's used by billions of people, you know, on the signal app itself, and also many more applications, including some not even on this slide. Okay, and also it won the Levchin Prize at Real World Crypto, so that's how you really know it's a practical thing. Okay, so what's what's the setting for uh, secure messaging? Well, first of all, protocol should be asynchronous, meaning that uh, the two parties involved in the messaging system uh, don't send in set rounds, but rather their communication can overlap some. 
Uh, and also, uh, they may be working over an unreliable network, meaning that message, messages may arrive arbitrarily out of order or even be completely lost in the network. And despite this, we still want what's called immediate decryption, meaning that if a receiver gets a ciphertext, no matter how much uh, or how out of order it is, they should be able to immediately decrypt it and place it in the right spot in the transcript. Okay, and then also uh, message loss resilience, which means that if a message is completely lost, then they shouldn't just kill all functionality of the protocol. Okay, also parties might be offline for extended periods. For example, if they're uh, flying to Santa Barbara for crypto, um, and ser the server should therefore provide a uh, mailbox service for parties so that when they do come back online, they can simply uh, download these messages from the server. Okay, also uh, protocols are very long lived. They can last you know, 10, uh, 10 years, something like this. So one might assume that uh, state le leakage could be likely over the lifetime of the protocol. Uh, and by this, I mean sort of a transient transient snapshot of the state. Okay, and finally, devices could be using bad randomness. Okay, so now with all these prop, uh, 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 with this setting of secure messaging, what are the security properties that we want? Well, first and foremost, we want end-to-end -end security, meaning that when there is no leakage, uh, these messages should be secure even from this server sitting in the middle. Okay, and then when there is a leakage, uh, we want forward security, meaning that past messages uh, should re remain secure uh, even after a leakage. Okay, and on the flip side, we want post-compromise security, meaning that if a user state is leaked, then uh, the protocol should sort of naturally recover so that uh, uh, security is regained at some point. Uh, and I say a uh, passive attacker, meaning that uh, once the attacker gets the state, it's passive because Otherwise, yeah, we don't really know what kind of guarantees we can we can provide since the attacker can probably just completely take over everything. Uh, but we do allow for an, uh, uh, attack, an active uh, adversary when they don't have these state leakages. Okay, and then finally, we want resilience against bad randomness, meaning that if there is no leakage, then injecting bad randomness uh, into the protocol should not hurt. Okay, and sort of the hard thing uh, about analyzing signal is that we want all of these properties simultaneously, including everything that I listed on the previous slide. Uh, and so intuitively, uh, for forward security, what do we do? We just delete keys that uh, aren't useful anymore. For post-compromise security, we refresh keys with uh, new randomness. And for resilience against ba uh, bad randomness, we leverage the security of old keys in our state. Okay, so uh, let's quickly talk about prior work. Uh, first, uh, in terms of signal, uh, there was the first seminal analysis in 2017 by Con Gordon et al, uh, where they analyzed the entire signal protocol as a sort of multi-stage key exchange uh, where the keys that are agreed upon are the actual keys uh, being used to encrypt and decrypt each message. Um, but unfortunately, uh, they did not pro provide much of an abstraction of the protocol and also didn't model uh, bad randomness nor immediate decryption. Uh, and then Alwyn et al. in 2019, uh, they did provide this clean abstraction uh, of the building blocks of the signal protocol um, into uh, uh, yeah, game-based primitives. Um, and for our paper, we, we sort of call this the gold standard of uh, double ratchet analysis. Uh, and yeah, I say double ratchet because actually uh, signal can be seen as uh, comprising of two parts. Uh, first, an initial key exchange protocol that gives the two parties some shared key material, and then sort of the backbone uh, messaging component which is called uh, the double ratchet. And this is also uh, the component that we study in our work. Okay, and uh, what we notice is that this ACD19 is sort of incomplete, meaning that some messages that uh, one might expect security for from the signal protocol 
aren't actually guaranteed security in, the, in their analysis. Okay, and then on, on the non-signal side, there are a line of works uh, that basically worked on strengthening the security properties of the signal protocol uh, by, for example, using stronger crypto primitives or maybe giving up on some uh, efficiency or other uh, sort of functionality properties. Um, and Yost et al. in 2019 studied the composability of the sort of general ratcheting technique that's at the core of a lot of uh, secure messaging. Uh, and finally, there is a line of work that studied the initial key exchange protocol of Signal, um, both, uh, both in terms of the actual Signal protocol and also extensions, uh, for example, to uh, get post-quantum security. Okay, so let's talk about uh, what, what our results are. Uh, so yeah, first of all, again, we only study the double ratchet, not the initial key exchange protocol. Um, and for this, we provide a UC-based simulation style definition, uh, which captures the security of the, of the double ratchet more tightly than uh, the prior works. Okay, and along the way, we capture the building blocks that seem intuitively necessary for this security. Uh, and finally, we uncover a minor weakness of the double ratchet and provide an efficient fix for it. And so before I, I explain our results in more depth, I want to uh, uh, explain the different uh, techniques and different results that the soft merge paper has. Um, so first of all, they model the complete signal protocol in the UC model. Uh, so this includes uh, the initial key exchange as well, along with uh, you know everything that comes with that. So like uh, the PKI and some other things. Um, and also they analyze all of the building blocks of Signal uh, via additional UC functionalities, uh, whereas we actually uh, provide game-based definitions for these building blocks. Okay, and then finally, uh, in with slightly weaker security than we guarantee for the double ratchet, uh, they minimize the use of the random oracle to only what is sort of required uh, for a fully adaptive uh, adversary. Uh, and so specifically uh, for non-committing encryption, when, for example, uh, the simulator is asked for a ciphertext without knowing the underlying, underlying plain text, and then the receiver uh, is corrupted. Uh, and so in order to do this, uh, they provide a, no a novel realization of the signal root KDF, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, uh, in the standard model. And whereas we uh, resort to using a programmable random oracle, uh, where so the using a random oracle seems necessary for our slightly stronger security. Uh, and then we also use the programmability uh, because basically we, we wanted to stick as close uh, to the signal, the actual signal specification as possible. Okay, and so yeah, obviously this doesn't uh, do their paper justice. So please, if you're interested, read their paper or also uh, watch their longer form video uh, on the website. Okay, so now uh, I'll go over sort of uh, at a high level how the double ratchet works and hopefully provide some more intuitive security properties for you. Uh, so as the name suggests, the first component is the public ratchet. Uh, which is actually a synchronous protocol, so a round-based protocol. Uh, and yeah, in this literature, we call rounds epochs. Um, and yeah, I'll show later on how the complete protocol manages to be asynchronous. Uh, okay, so let's say Alice initiates a conversation. Uh, and so actually, the first thing that happens is Bob will uh, upload some public key to the server. Uh, G to the X zero. And then when Alice wants to uh, initiate a conversation, she'll download one of Bob's public keys uh, and then sample some X1 and X1 and derive the shared Diffie Hellman key, K1. Okay. And then she'll, she'll send this G to the X1 to Bob. He'll, of course, be able to, to do the same. And this K1 will seed what's called a symmetric ratchet. 
which is what Alice and Bob use to actually uh, symmetrically encrypt and decrypt messages. Uh, and I'll expand on this in, in a few slides. Uh, but okay, then when Bob wants to start a new epoch, he does the same. He samples the next two and sends it to, to Alice and we sort of keep going like this. Okay, and so first I claim that this public ratchet provides post-compromise security because at this point, uh, if Bob is corrupted, then of course we know that this symmetric ratchet number one will be compromised. But if he has good randomness, then this K2 key should be secure. Okay. Uh, and then for forward security, um, once Bob starts this new epoch, he can delete this old key material from uh, epoch number one so that even if he is corrupted now, this first ratchet should be secure. Okay, so actually I, I swept some details under the rug. Uh, so there's a little bit more going on in the public ratchet. Uh, so what happens is that each epoch T also has this root key sigma T. So Alice and Bob both start out with some sigma zero, which is part of the uh, key material that they agree on uh, from the initial key exchange. Uh, and when they derive a new uh, Diffie-Hellman key, they input both into a KDF, which then spits out one, the symmetric ratchet seed, and also a new root key. Okay, and so then again, they, they keep doing this sort of thing as new Diffie-Hellman keys come in. Okay, uh, so now uh, I claim that this provides uh, resilience against bad randomness, because even if this newly sampled X2 was you know, even completely chosen by the adversary. Uh, and so this Diffie-Hellman shared key will be insecure. Well, if there's no leakage before this, then sigma one will be secure. And so then the, the output of this KDF will be secure. Okay, so now finally uh, the symmetric ratchet. Uh, so uh, for each message I in some epoch T, we have a unique chain key CKTI and a unique message key MKTI. Okay, and so this CKT0 is basically what I was referring to before as the seed of each symmetric ratchet. Okay, and so when Alice uh, or Bob wants to encrypt or decrypt a new message, basically they input this to a KDF, which spits out both a message key MKT1, which they will actually use to encrypt or decrypt, and also a new chain key. Okay, and then when they want to do another message, they do the same thing. Okay, and so this provides forward secrecy because after Alice or Bob is done with these old keys, they can just delete it. And so then a, a, a corrupting adversary uh, won't be able to get this old information. Uh, and also the symmetric ratchet is deterministic. So actually the adversary will be able to get uh, all future derivations too, uh, but this is actually still a good thing for functionality uh, because this is actually what allows uh, the protocol to be asynchronous. And that's because, um, uh, well, asynchronous and also uh, achieve this immediate decryption property. Uh, and that's because each ciphertext will have attached to it the corresponding index within the epoch and also the public ratchet component, component of the epoch. Okay, so yeah, this is what provides immediate decryption and message loss resilience, because basically if the third message of an epoch comes first, the index will tell the receiver and so they can just uh, jump directly to uh, the third message key via this KDF. Okay. So yeah, hopefully that provides some more intuition on how the double ratchet works. Um, so now let me briefly say some, uh, some of the security properties of signal uh, that weren't captured by prior works. Uh, so specifically in our, in our paper, we found six distinct ways in which the prior works uh, didn't capture uh, signal security. And for CCD 17, this was 
and uh, uh, no bad randomness and no immediate decryption in their modeling. And for ACD19, uh, basically they provided only coarse uh, security guarantees surrounding state leakages. So for example, some messages sent immediately after uh, a, a state leakage didn't have any security guarantees in their analysis, even though uh, these messages are secure in signal. Okay, and both uh, didn't fully capture also CCA security immediately after a leakage. Um, and for this, we, we realized that uh, uh, the double ratchet intuitively needs uh, the strong Diffie-Hellman assumption uh, and the random oracle model along with CCA secure uh, AEAD. And this is exactly what we need to pr prove CCA security for Hashdell Gamal. So this kind of makes sense. Uh, and yeah, so I want to stress that although like both of these works sort of uh, did did things that we're doing in our paper, I I think like our our fine-grained modular analysis that sort of maybe put their works together in some sense allowed us to have a deeper understanding of the protocol and you know understand uh, for which messages we should expect to have security. And so from this, we were able to uncover uh, a minor weakness of signal uh, and also fix it efficiently. So now I'll, I'll, I'll discuss this weakness. Uh, so let's say that Alice is about to start a new epoch. Uh, and so she has uh, the root key sigma t along with the public ratchet component of Bob's last epoch, g to x t minus one. And so she'll sample, uh, oh, okay, sorry. So let's say now she's uh, corrupted. Then, uh, of course, this sigma t uh, is leaked. But if Alice has fresh randomness, then again, we expect security for this new epoch because one of the inputs to the KDF will be secure. Okay, and so then namely all of these messages in this epoch, we expect security for. Okay, and then if we take away this corruption, uh, Alice at this point will have deleted all key, old key material. So again, if she was corrupted here, we expect forward security. Okay, so all these messages should be secure. So now Bob, on his side, once he receives one of these uh, epoch T messages, he of course can also uh, he of course can also derive this sigma T plus one. And so then when he wants to send a new, uh, start a new epoch, he'll again sample this new randomness, xt plus one, uh, and derive this g to the xt, xt plus one shared Diffie-Hellman key and encrypt in much the same way. And so observe that, of course, Alice still needs this xt secret exponent to be able to decrypt Bob's next uh, epoch messages. So in fact, also this xt will be corrupted. So now if we put together these two corruptions, uh, if Alice is both corrupted before this epoch starts, and then also um, uh, at the end of this epoch, but importantly, before she receives the mess uh, any message from Bob's next epoch, uh, then first of all, we get this sigma t corrupted, and also we get this xt corrupted, and so then all of these messages will be insecure. Okay, so how do we fix this? First of all, I want to mention that uh, ACD uh, did actually consider a separate security notion uh, that did prevent this attack, uh, but not really explicitly uh, from their modeling. Um, and also, uh, they achieve this security with an extra group element in communication per message, uh, whereas we, in our fix, uh, require no additional communication and about the same computation. And we call this the triple ratchet. And we get security from either the random oracle model or uh, circular security of Elgamal encryption. And also, uh, we get some further security properties uh, which are kind of complex to explain. So uh, yeah, look at the paper if you're interested. Um, and also there are further applications to 
uh, this updatable public key encryption primitive and secure group messaging. Okay, so here's our fix. So let's say we're in the same scenario. Alice wants to start a new epoch. So she'll do the same thing. She'll, she'll sample some new uh, secret exponent uh, and derive this shared Diffie-Hellman key and put it through the KDF along with the shared root key sigma t. But now, in addition, we'll output this delta t value from the KDF. And Alice will simply use this to mask her secret key xt. Okay, and we call this a mini ratchet of the, of the Diffie-Hellman secret key. Okay, so, and, and now, uh, after she does this, she can, of course, forget xt and delta t. Okay, and so, yeah, she'll, she'll send in much the same way as before. And then when Bob, uh, yeah, and delete, delete her old keys when she, when she can. And then uh, when Bob gets one of these messages, he'll still be able to uh, compute uh, the KDF. So he'll still get the sigma t plus one and also this delta t value, okay? And so he can namely exponentiate the g to the xt that he gets from Alice with this delta t value. And so then when he wants to start a new epoch, he can sample some new xt plus one, derive this new Diffie-Hellman shared key, which Alice will also be able to compute because she has xt delta t in her state now uh, and send as before. So if we look at the corruption scenario from before, the first corruption will give the adversary sigma t still, but the second corruption will only give the advers adversary this xt times delta t. Uh, and so uh, this g of the xt minus one xt should still be secure. And so we, we still get security for this epoch. Okay, so yeah, again, we, we solve this issue uh, with a technique that allows for the same communication and just a little bit more computation. Okay, and so we're happy. Um, and yeah, so that's about it. I think I'm probably running low on time. So yeah, I'll just conclude by saying that, um, yeah, uh, looking at the security of real world crypto systems can be tough. But if you work hard enough, then you can really sort of understand uh, more the security properties of the protocol and maybe uncover these uh, uh, sort of weaknesses that, that we uncover in the paper. Uh, so yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Alex, for the talk. Um, if there are any questions, uh, yeah, please come to the microphones. Um, is this going to be a question? Yes. Yes, thank you for the very nice talk. It was excellent. A uh, question with Signal as it currently stands in their implementation, keys are not immediately deleted. In fact, it's several epochs later that they begin to be deleted. So how does that affect your security model here? Uh, I mean, even, even when uh, they know that the keys are useless, they still keep them around. I was yeah, not aware. Yeah, five epochs. Interesting, okay. I was not completely aware of that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess we do assume that keys are uh, deleted basically once the protocol knows that they're no longer useful, so. I mean, basically, we only keep around keys uh, if they need to be used for decryption. I guess that's that's what our security model requires. Okay. It, even if there was um, keys left around, would this gain some security? Uh, you mean this fix? Yes. Yeah, so even if they aren't deleted, is there? Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess maybe I would need to know more about the implementation details, uh, even on the sender side, you, you're saying that these keys are interesting. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's something to look at more than definitely. Yeah. Thank I you. don't. Yeah.
Okay, any other question? Maybe one quick question from my side. Uh, I think one of the special parts of both of the papers is that you used uh, UC models uh, to analyze it, and both of the works try to uh, analyze signal much more uh, precisely than what prior work did. Uh, from your experience, would you say that or was was it the purpose that you used UC for that? And did it help you to uh, get a more precise uh, understanding of signal? Or what's what was the reason? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's maybe a bit more subjective. I mean, I think originally we wanted to uh, understand the security provided by signal in more detail because, yeah, we we thought maybe from the prior works, we were unsure about certain cases. Um, I think for UC, like uh, one thing we wanted was maybe composability uh, for building secure group messaging and other things. Um, but yeah, I mean, also one could argue that when you look at things in sort of the simulation-based paradigm, then uh, you try to maybe consider a completely uh, unrestricted adversary first, and maybe this uh, lets you sort of more closely understand the security rather than going like the other way around and sort of uh, restricting the adversary first. Okay, thank you very much. Let's speak. Let's thank the speaker again. And we are already at the last talk for this session with the title on the insider security of MLS. And this paper is by Joel Alvin, Daniel Joost, and Marta Ma, uh, sorry, uh, Mulajic. And uh, the talk is by Marta. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Yeah. So the general area that we're interested in doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah. Uh, the general area that we're interested in is uh, secure group communication, sometimes called group ratcheting. And here the goal is to allow a dynamic group of parties to exchange confidential data over an insecure channel. So examples are, are well known from the real life. This includes secure group chats. So any application that you use to communicate with your friends, hopefully it's secure. And then this is part of this landscape. But you could also imagine secure video calls or secure conferences. This will all be kind of part of this landscape. Uh, you could also think of it as generalization, of, okay, some, something similar to two-party secure messaging, which was the topic of the previous talk. A similar thing, but for groups. Now, the core primitive that enables secure group communication is, in my opinion, something called continuous group key agreement or CGKA. And here the goal kind of sounds similar. So it's for a dynamic group of parties, again, to exchange uh, a sequence of shared uh, symmetric group keys. So I forgot what it means to say dynamic. Well, dynamic uh, means that the properties of the group, such as you can think of the members, the set of members, the uh, set of administrators, uh, etc., can change within one session. So we can add, remove members. Okay, so in CGKA, the goal is to exchange a sequence of shared group keys. This means that uh, a CGKA protocol will create a sequence of epochs. And an epoch is simply a period of time when the group has a fixed set of properties. So you will have the fixed member set, for example, in epoch one. And the CGKA protocol will equip uh, each epoch with a shared group key known to the current group members and only those. So that's the goal to establish these keys. Now, at any point in time, any group member can decide to change uh, the properties, which means that they create a new epoch. For example, if Alice decides to remove Charlie, uh, she will create a new epoch without Charlie and with a new key unknown to Charlie. Then it can continue. Maybe Alice adds uh, Dave in Charlie's place. This again creates, creates a new epoch. And another thing that can happen, can happen is that Bob, for example, sim simply decides to up update his secrets because they have been lying around for too long. Uh, and so this creates, again, a new epoch with a fresh shared key. 
One other piece of information that is missing from this picture is the PKI. The CGKA and secure messaging protocols usually work in the PKI model. And so the PKI will be used, for example, by Alice when she adds a new party, Dave, to make sure that the public keys she's adding to the group or the public uh, data actually belongs to, to Dave and not to someone else. And vice versa, when Dave joins the group, he will also contact the PKI to make sure that the person inviting him is actually Alice and not some malicious party. So I hope you can imagine how CGKA can be used to build secure group communication applications. Basically, the uh, shared secret key, which is outputted by CGKA, can be used to, for example, encrypt messages in secure messaging, in secure chats. It can be used to encrypt video stream or to authenticate group members. So really, this is kind of simple, symmetric cryptography. Um, and so the core of the problem is captured by CGKA. So CGKA is what we're going to look at uh, in this work and in the rest of this talk. Now, one more thing that I want to uh, mention about CGKA is that the setting is kind of um, very particular for, for this type of protocols. It's different than, uh, for example, for TLS or uh, multi-party computation. So first of all, we want to be able to deal with thousands of parties. Groups will be huge, like 5,000, 10,000 people in a group, for example, all employees of an orga organization. This is much different than, for example, TLS. And so the requirement is that the protocol needs to be scalable uh, in terms of both communication and computational complexity. Ideally, it should be sublinear in the group size. Another uh, aspect is that parties will often be offline. This is kind of sad truth in secure messaging. If we have 5,000 people in the group, we cannot imagine that they will come, all come online at the same time to execute some sort of interactive protocol. We cannot wait for this. And so protocols should be non-interactive or, some, or uh, also called asynchronous, maybe more often in this literature, which basically means that uh, parties communicate via a mailboxing service or a dead drop. Uh, service where they can just leave messages for each other, go offline, and then any party can take the message from the mailbox and continue with the protocol. So if you remember the epochs, right, the only thing that I need to do to create an epoch is to create one message, put it in the mailbox, maybe I go offline, I throw away my phone, I go to crypto, and then other people uh, at any time can receive, take this message out of the mailbox and, and continue. And finally, we have long-lived sessions. I don't know about your groups, but I have groups that live like for years on end. Uh, and so we want fine-grained security within a session. So this is, uh, again, different than in TLS, for example, where it's just the whole session is secure or the whole session is insecure. Uh, here we want fine-grained security within a session. Uh, this can be seen in a picture. This is the same picture as before. We basically want that if the state of some party, in this case, Bob, leaks in one epoch, then some epochs will be secure, will be insecure, well, because the key is leaked, but some epochs remain secure. So, for example, the past epochs are secure by a property called for forward secrecy. Uh, and then after Bob replaces his secrets by his leaked secrets by fresh ones, that happens in epoch four, we get security back. This is called post-compromise security. So I hope this kind of uh, convinces you that um, CGKA is worth studying and kind of shows you roughly what, what it does. So this brings me to our contribution, which actually follows a pattern that uh, all of you here are very familiar, uh, are extreme, extremely familiar with. We take, uh, real-world construction, in our case called ITK, just the name of the protocol. Uh, we take a very important primitive, in our case CGKA, and we prove that the protocol ITK is a secure CGKA in a strong adversarial model. In our case, we call it malicious insiders. So this is a new model. It's based on, uh, on previous models, of course, but uh, it has some nice aspects that improve on, on the previous models and uh, give new security guarantees. 
So in the rest of this talk, I'm going to tell you about uh, what, where ITK comes from and what we prove about it. Except, of course, life is never that simple. So in fact, in our analysis, we discovered real attacks against the protocol as it stood then, uh, which actually broke it in, in reality. And so we proposed fixes. Fortunately, it was easy to fix. So now the ITK is fixed. And therefore, this is the, the result of this work. That ITK is the fixed ITK, is a secure such KA against malicious insiders. So now, uh, where does ITK come from? It's a part of a protocol called Messaging Layer Security, or MLS. This is basically a messaging protocol. Uh, it is based on a CGKA, but it also has a functionality really related to, to messaging. It's an upcoming RFC standard, uh, and it has, so it's really a real world protocol that will be implemented, that is already being implemented. Uh, and uh, it has lots of nice features. I think the most important one it has is that it has a communication complexity that usually scales logarithmically in the group size. And uh, a disclaimer here usually is not a scientific term. Uh, in fact, the worst case, uh, worst case com complexity is linear in the group size, but there are good indications that it will scale logarithmically in most of the cases. So in, in, in any case, this is a cool protocol. It's worth to look at. It's being implemented and used. Now, ITK, uh, here the name stands for Insider Secure Trichem, and it's basically the CGKA of the MLS protocol. It contains those MLS components that make up its, uh, its CGK. So first of all, the, com the most important component is TRICAM. This is simply MLS's name for the core of, core of its CGK. That's why we call it um, insider, insider Secure TRICAM. But also other um, mechanisms of MLS that are actually needed to get the right security notion of, uh, for the group keys that, that we want. So, for example, message signing, transcript hashes, various tags, etc. cetera. Uh, just a short remark is that we uh, isolating these components of MLS from the RFC specification was not an easy task, uh, or maybe less easy than you might imagine. We went through it. We have a precise pseudocode description in, of ITK in the paper. So if you're struggling with the RFC, that might be a resource that helps you. Um, okay, so this is all I want to say about ITK. I don't want to say anything about how it works. It's quite complex, you can imagine probably. I want to tell you in the rest of this, uh, of this talk what we prove about it. So what is this, uh, yeah, what is the security statement in, at a high level? So if, you want to, if we want to define security, we of course have to start with the attacker capabilities. Here, uh, the adversary is super strong. First of all, it can continuously leak the states of parties. Recall that we want this um, fine green security where the state can leak at one point in time, then maybe parties refresh their secrets, uh, end up in a secure state, then the st states leak again, and so on. So this is what continuous me means in this case. Further, the adversary has full control over the network, no restrictions. Uh, it can even control the PKI. We don't even trust the PKI. And finally, it can control randomness used by parties. So uh, this models bad randomness generators. This is the adversary. Now, what security do we want with this adversary? Uh, in our paper, we use the universal composability or UC framework by uh, Canetti. And so we, this means that we define an ideal CGKA functionality, which expresses all the properties that a good CGKA should have. Uh, except I think it's too complicated for this talk. <laughs> so I'm just going to tell you about a couple of properties that are implied by this definition. So first of all, it captures correctness. This is what you might expect. Uh, more importantly, it captures the security properties, which is agreement on the group stage, confidentiality of group keys and authenticity of messages. In a bit more detail, agreement on the group state means that uh, all members in a given epoch agree on the current properties of the group. As I said, they can change dynamically in, epoch, in each epoch they're different. 
And so they, they have the same set of members, they know the same group key, and they also agree on the last epoch, which by induction means that they agree on the whole um, sequence of epochs leading to this given one. Really a basic property. Uh, one other thing that has to be here is that recall that, uh, that the CGKA protocols live in the PKI uh, model. So there is some PKI. And so the members will be identified by some PKI keys. So we also want agreement on that, right? We have some PKI identities. Here, Alice, Bob, and Charlie are identified by some um, public keys, and we want agreement on that. And this is something we introduced in this model. So this is new in our insider model. This is agreement. Now, for confidentiality, this is maybe what you might expect even more than uh, agreement. Uh, we want that the group key in a given epoch, E, is indistinguishable from random, uh, uniform random string from the point of view of the adversary. Of course, given corruptions, uh, this cannot be true in all epochs. So we will use a predicate here called conf, uh, which takes an epoch with all its properties, like the set of members, the PKI keys, etc., and a symbolic representation of executions, including corruptions, uh, all epochs that have been created, etc. And it decides if the uh, if authenticity is guaranteed in this epoch or not. So in the picture, this is again the same picture as before. If the state of some party leaks in epoch two, uh, the predicate will be false in epochs two and three. This means that the keys are arbitrary, the adversary chooses them, but it will be true in epochs one and four, uh, meaning that the keys in epoch one and four look random and independent from the devil's point of view. Uh, right. So this is our confidentiality. And for authenticity, um, this is again, probably expected, the ad it says that the adversary can't impersonate a party P in a given epoch E. Hopefully for all parties in epochs, but of course we cannot guarantee this during corruptions, uh, due to corruptions. So we will have an authenticity predicate here called out, which takes an epoch and a party, and again, a symbolic representation of an execution and decides if authenticity is guaranteed. A couple of remarks about these conf and out predicates uh, is that these are actually parameters of the notion. And so the goal of a protocol designer is to get the best conf and out predicates uh, possible as they can somehow. So one of our contributions in this work is to exactly define the predicates for the IPK protocol. Again, to complicate it, I won't uh, explain them in full detail in this paper. Instead, what I want to show is, uh, so this concludes the, the security properties that we want. Uh, I want to show you a couple of examples to maybe get you more familiar with how it works and uh, what security we prove for IPK, in what cases, in what scenarios we prove, secure, prove it secure. So the first special case is about injected epochs. It showcases what uh, an active network adversary can do. So let's say we have an epoch where the state of Bob leaks, some, some epoch E. Uh, in this epoch, so we will focus on the conf predicate now because it doesn't matter which predicate it is. Um, the conf predicate will be false in this epoch. And now the state of Bob is, Bob is completely leaked to the adversary. So what the adversary can do uh, controlling the network is to come up with some random message and inject it on Bob's behalf, right? And let's say he does that. This creates a new epoch. Uh, maybe it's interpreted as uh, after Bob updating his, his secrets, but the epoch is completely made up by the adversary in his head, right? We cannot say anything about it. Maybe the adversary copy pasted something he saw on the network. Maybe it made up some, uh, some random data. So again, yeah, uh, the epoch is, is completely made up. And, uh, but then the, the execution can continue, right? So the adversary injected this message to Alice and Charlie. Bob probably cannot go to, to, to the message, uh, to the epoch created on his behalf, but Alice and Charlie are in epoch E plus one. And so what, the, what can happen next is that Alice maybe decides to remove Bob. 
maybe Bob behaves strange, she suspects he's corrupted, so she removes Bob. And then we want security back. So conf becomes true because we have two parties with good states and no party with bad state. So this kind of shows that the protocol needs to be kind of very resilient against these malformed messages. We went through a bad epoch created completely by the adversary and ended up in a good epoch afterwards. This also makes it hard to define, by the way. The second example is about detached epochs. Uh, and this showcases what um, our modeling of PKI can express. So let's say again, we have an adversary uh, who injects a message, but instead of injecting a message to some group members, it injects a message to a new joining party. In this case, C. So on, uh, on behalf of Bob, the adversary adds C to the group and injects the message to C. This creates a completely new epoch. Maybe it's completely fake, doesn't belong anywhere. We don't even know what epoch was before that because, well, the epoch, given epoch doesn't contain all the information about all past epochs. A completely fake epoch. Uh, in this epoch, we have corrupted Bob who invited Charlie. We have honest Charlie who joins the group. And we have Alice who don't, we don't really know anything about. And then it can continue as before. Charlie can remove Bob. And then we end up in a new epoch when, where there is no corrupt Bob anymore. Uh, there is an honest Charlie. But we can't really say anything about the conf predicate here, here in this epoch because we don't know what about Alice. Is she made up by the adversary or is, she, uh, is her state somehow copied from another part of the execution where she created something? We can't say. So before our modeling of PKI in this work, all we could say, well, we couldn't say anything. So conf would have to be false here. Now with our modeling, uh, we recall that we have the public keys in each epoch. So we have the public key of Alice, the public key of Charlie, the probably corrupt public key of Bob. Uh, and now in epoch E plus one, let's say the public key of Alice is, is honest. It's not corrupted. We keep track of which PKI keys are injected or uh, are created or leaked by the adversary. Let's say this key has not been leaked or created by the adversary. We have Bob uh, with secure key. And so the guarantee is that the conf predicate is true if all PKI keys are good. There is a then at the end, but uh, yes. So if uh, the conf, conf predicate is true, if all PKI keys in a given epoch is good, which allows us to uh, deem this last epoch secure. While in previous models, we couldn't say anything about it. And so this is the guarantee that the fixed ITK um, provides. So this, which brings me to, to the fix. And again, I won't tell you what the fix is, but uh, the previous ITK provided a much weaker guarantee in this setting, uh, which is to say that the conf predicate is true if each PKI key in a, in a given epoch is good and is only used in other good epochs. Okay, so for example, if there is another epoch where Alice used, yeah, that should be uh, the other way around, so I think, yeah, whatever. Uh, so uh, Alice, okay, yeah, that, that's correct, sorry. <laughs> so if there is another epoch where there is some, uh, where Alice used her good PKI key with some other party, let's say, I don't know, uh, party Z who used the PKI PK5 and PK5 turned out to be bad, then it doesn't matter that Alice's key is good. We still have to deem the, uh, the new epoch insecure. So this is a much weaker guarantee. And after our fix, we get the expected guarantee that I said in the uh, previous slide. Right, so this, is, uh, this was not captured by previous models because they were not fine-grained enough. So, Finally, to put it in, in a bit of perspective, uh, this is the, these are the models that have analyzed MLS. First one, I think the biggest difference between these models is how strong the adversary is with respect to being able to inject messages or not. So the first one is it's passive. It makes sense to relax the, pro, uh, the um, model in these first uh, works. The adversary cannot inject anything. Then we have a semi-active adversary, or what I'm going to call semi-active. Here, the adversary can try to inject messages, but only when the protocol is supposed to defend against it. 
so only when the output ticket is false, which means that these injections actually won't happen because the protocol protects against them. And actually both of these special cases that I just mentioned are, mentioned are, are outside of the semi-active model. Uh, then there is the active model where the adversary can inject, but there is no PKI modeling. This is the model we use as the basis of our work, but it hasn't been used to analyze IPK or MLS. And finally, our model where the adversary fully controls the network, can inject messages and uh, control the PKI and we have the fine, fine grain currency. There are also other works uh, which also consider similar powers of the adversary. Uh, but the first one is symbolic, so not cryptographic, different. And the second one uh, only models key derivations, so one small part of IDK. To conclude, I have a couple of open questions. Uh, first of all, full analysis of MLS or better analysis. Maybe uh, we could analyze all features of this protocol that we haven't touched. Or actually, no one from the cryptographic community has touched. That's just session resumption, external pre-shared keys, et cetera. Uh, UC security with fully adaptive corruptions. As I said, we model UC security, but we restrict the environment not to corrupt at certain times because we have the commitment problem. Um, so non-committing encryption would be something that allows to prove full UC security. Uh, then maybe more properties of MLS. We just analyzed the three that I mentioned, but maybe you can analyze metadata, uh, post-quantum security as usual. It's we only have like um, standard model, ran okay, sorry, random oracle model, uh, not post quantum proofs. Uh, simpler security analysis, uh, both defining and, and, and proving IPK secure is quite um, involved, quite complicated. So maybe parts of the symbolic analysis could help as well. Uh, and then, of course, as usual, more efficient protocols. Okay, so that concludes my talk. Thanks. Yeah, since we started with the session with five minutes delay inherited from the prior one, we have maybe uh, one half minute for a question. And if there is none, I don't see any in the chat either. Um, maybe a quick question. Um, Signal still uses pairwise channels, uh, probably also with the goal of uh, yeah, being secure against insiders. Maybe they don't achieve agreement, but uh, do you have an intuition for how the two protocols compare to each other? Like You mean, you mean Signal's uh, way of using pairwise channels between each pair of group members. Yeah, exactly. yeah, they don't achieve agreement. I think this is a bit an annoying kind of because it's it's a nice property. We all agree on the current state. Well, in Signal, you have to, I guess, use some um, outside methods to um, agree on who's actually in the group, right? Uh, they, they have uh, some actually pretty kind of involved and cool protocols for that, which is, which is cool. But you have to do this while ITK gives you that out of, out of, out of the box. Uh, another thing is the communication complexity, which is obviously linear in the double ratchet. Uh, here you have logarithmic or optimistically logarithmic. That's uh, another feature. You get different security predicates, how exactly they compare. Um, I, I can't really say precisely. Yeah, maybe then a quick uh, second question. Would your model work to analyze it? Like oh, if yeah. you, comp okay. Yeah. Well, it doesn't achieve agreement. So assume that we also have some um, mechanism on top of these um, double ratchets that ach that achieves agreement, then I th then the model would be useful for that as well. Okay, thank you very much. Let's thank the speaker again. And that's the end of this session and the end of all talks today. See you at the dinner later. Thank you. I'm going to close out the room now. <laughs>